thank you all for, first off, coming here. Great first part of the uh, day, half day. First part of the half day, we call that a quarter. Half of a half day is a quarter. Great second quarter coming in here right now. We have, as a follow-up to the 21st Century Media Company, we'd like to talk about the 21st Century <laughs> Agency. So we have Mike Bologna, president of Modi Media, coming up once again, fireside chat with Will Richmond, the founder of and editor and publisher of Video News. Please welcome our guests. Thank you. All right. OK, thanks, Scott. And uh, you, know, you can still introduce me as Will Smith if you prefer. I, I'll take either one. Um, but uh, just like him. Thank you. Facial hair. Um, so Mike, welcome. Uh, Thank you. And we have, I think, about 20 minutes. We'll see how things go. And maybe we'll open it up for a couple of audience questions as well. But um, I'm assuming most people are familiar with Modi. But it'd probably be good just to take 30 seconds up front to explain what Modi is and what, what you do there. Sure. So <clears throat> Modi is an advanced video unit with inside of Group M. And to be honest with you, we were founded and formed on the back of a lot of what's been and will be discussed uh, today. You know, for the longest time, we've all been talking about the evolution of television and video as it relates to data and technology and automation and systems. But there's a real big difference between talking about it and doing it, right? Anybody can talk about it. But to do it and to really execute these capabilities properly, it requires specialized knowledge and it requires bandwidth. And I think it was mentioned on one of the earlier panels, bandwidth is something that's in uh, short supply at agencies. So rather than expect our general media pra practitioners to fit all of this stuff into their already overloaded uh, mornings, afternoons, and evenings, we decided to create a unit. There's 30 of us now. And that's all we do every day is work with all the data, the technology, the platforms, and the systems and execute these campaigns from start to finish. <clears throat> and uh, you know, we think we do it really well. Cool. So, um, and addressability, obviously, you, I don't know if you mentioned the word addressability, but that's really the core focus here at, at Modi, it's, right? It's, it's, it's targeted television, I would say, it's a core, it's, it's, it's a core focus. Modi really operates three businesses. We operate a, um, an entertainment business out on the West Coast that helps studios market their films once they land on DVD and um, EST. We, um, we operate an over-the-top business, which is increasingly growing with all of the consumers that are now entertaining themselves on televisions that are connected to the internet or devices that connect the TVs to the internet. But the core focus is what everyone's talking about today is what we call targeted television. And that is a combination of household level addressability, zip and zone level targeting, and, and, and high indexing, which is what, uh, what Jason Brown's new announcement and they all have a different place, but the backbone and the fundamental principles of all of targeted television is working with an advertiser, helping them figure out who they really want to reach, finding the appropriate data source, matching it against the subscriber files, determining the appropriate universe, using the tech in the boxes to insert the message to just those households at the right frequency, at the right time, at the right price, and then on the back end, turn around and measure it properly and be able to go show the advertiser exactly how much bang they got for their buck. That sounds actually like a mouthful. That's uh, a fair number of things that have to happen. Can I have, have a sip of my coffee there. now yes. after that? <laughs> Please. Um, how's that all going? I mean, is it, uh, is it I mean, smooth at this point? Is it so you know, kind of? It's, it's, it's probably the least automated and least systematic part of our business right now, but, but I mean, it's booming in terms of business. I mean, we're working with over 100 clients, and we probably have developed over 200 different segments, right? Because each client will have a different segment for a different campaign, which requires a different data source. You know, every system uses different tech and a different process and reports back differently. So probably the hardest part of our job is stitching together all the different systems because remember, when you're talking about household addressability, you're talking about a cable, satellite, or telecommunications company that's installed the appropriate firmware into their boxes to allow them to behave like an ad server, right? But they all do it differently. We're also working with the local two minutes per hour of inventory that they own and operate. So stitching all that together is probably the hardest part. Um, 
The most rewarding part is being able to go back to the advertiser at the end of the campaign and show them that it worked. I mean, I can honestly say that we can go back to our advertisers and say, here we developed a segment of homes in the market to buy a specific vehicle. Here's how much you spent. Here are the households that saw the ad. Here's how many cars you sold. Here's your return on ad spend. Households in the market to buy a particular brand of your competitor's soup. Here's how many households saw the ad. Here's how many households bought your soup. And here's where the share came from. We took first party data, matched it against subscriber files, and then went back and told the advertiser at the end of the campaign, here's how many of your customers or how many of your non-customers, depending on how we messaged it, became a customer. So to really get this right, and why we formed Modi, and why it's so complicated, is you have to get the segment right. If the segment is too large, you might as well continue to buy national television because the economics would support that theory. If the segment's too small, it's not worth the data and the tech and the infrastructure and all the systematic costs associated with the campaign. But if that segment is just right, and the math works properly, and you develop the appropriate form of measurement on the back end, and you double check the math, and you double check all the work, I've never seen this not work. When you say never seen it not work, what does success actually if mean? What, do, what type of, you know, what's the ROI target? What's so the, the metric? ROI is, is tying it back to sales. Tying television back to sales. Because don't forget, in television, you know, with all due respect to the business that is still the largest part of what we do, you know, we kind of ask 20,000 people what they watch and assume the other 100 million watch the same. And we buy <laughs> networks and programs based on what the 20,000 people are watching. And we, and we call it a day. And, 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 and the advertiser says, I'm on TV, I'm selling stuff. I'm off TV, I'm not selling as much stuff. Or they measure it via an econometric model. So being able to take a product like this and be able to go back to the advertiser, eliminate that national noise, and show them how many cars they sold on that campaign. That's a huge success, huge success. One of the things that came up, I think, on the first session today was the idea that even with addressability, you still have to have the right creative <coughs> in front of the right target. Is, is that one of the key issues, and has that been surmounted now in so these kind of 100 plus campaigns? The gentleman from MasterCard made a good point. So right now, <coughs> addressability, like we still have a scale issue, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have a scale issue in the sense that only a third of every US TV household has addressable capability. And while we're still working with the local two minutes per hour, inventory is limited. So most clients use addressability right now as a means to increase their frequency against their core customer segment without the burden of the waste. So the existing creative does work. As we scale this, either in inventory or in footprint, as, as, as they were talking about earlier, now we do need to start creating specific creative for each message. But then that goes back to the math, right? It's expensive to create a 30 second commercial. And our legacy culture says, spend 500 grand, spend a million dollars, create this beautiful spot. That doesn't work if that spot needs to be 12 spots. Right, so the ROI today, the um, positive ROI model that you described, today is sort of predicated on the same, essentially the same creative being used in the addressable portion of the buy uh, as in the general buy. It is, because in most cases, that creative was developed for that addressable segment. Right. We just don't have the means within national television to execute on that core segment. Right. Hence, addressability fits right in. But to your point and to the gentleman from MasterCard's point, as this scales, we will absolutely have to solve the creative problem. Right, and I'm sure this, the answer on this ranges, but um, in general, kind of what's the lift in terms of price point to do an addressable buy versus a you know, regular kind of agent's MO type buy? Yeah, so everybody asks that question. Addressable CPMs can range you know, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the lower end of, of $15 to $20, on the higher end of $300 to $400. But it's not necessarily the price point that generates the value. It's the price point versus what Jason Brown referred to as the eCPM. So every time we create a campaign for an advertiser, we say, here's what you're paying in national cable. You may be paying $20 for women 25 to 54. But if your target are women with children that have purchased a particular brand of soup, and that's who you want, that $20 is really $150. Therefore, a $44 CPM is hot, much higher than your national, but it's much lower than what you're actually paying. 
And that's what I meant before about if we do our job right and get the segment right and the math right. But I will be honest with you, Will. We write hundreds and hundreds of addressable plans for clients, and probably about a third of every one we write, the recommendation back to the advertiser is addressability is not the right approach for you right now because either your segment size isn't right, the math doesn't add up, or in some cases, if you're a big legacy television brand, your national CPM is so efficient that you can afford all the waste in the world. Right. And that's okay too. You know, don't we never believe that even if 100% of households were addressable, that 100% of an advertiser's budget would be used that way, right? It's, 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 it's gonna ultimately just feed that funnel. Addressability in five years is gonna be a, a tool to balance frequency between your mass audience, your individual household, and everybody in between. And what has to happen over the next five years in order to achieve what you just described? So the, the, the two scale issues we talked about. Right now, we're working with four addressable systems. And I say this in alphabetical order because we don't like to play favorites with anyone, right? So we're talking about Cablevision, Comcast, Dish Network, and see, AT&T, not DirecTV, they should have right. been first. Clearly, right. I can't. I know my alphabet. Right. Um, it has to grow beyond that. Right. But we expect Cox to come in the picture um, later this year, early next year. If Charter and Time Warner ever get their shit together, that'll be another uh, <laughs> huge thing, but we expect 60 to 65% of US TV households to have an addressable footprint once all that happens, and that's a good thing. But here's what's gonna happen then. Once that happens, then you start to get all these incremental advertisers that come into the mix, either because there is more scale or because they're starting to understand the value based on a lot of the casework that is being, has been, or will be discussed. So that now that two minutes per hour is gonna run away quickly. So now we're gonna need more inventory. What happens then? The only incremental inventory is the national inventory. And that discussion, that debate on how to make that national inventory addressable is really a conversation between the operator who owns the pipes, the tech, and the boxes, and the media owner that owns that content. And unfortunately, that's, there's very little that uh, any of the rest of us can do to move that forward. So, um, w w you know, can you characterize sort of where those discussions between the operator and the, net and, the, and the network stand in terms of making national inventory available? I mean, I think both sides are open to it, but both sides want to control it. I'm a national broadcaster cable network. My right. perspective to the operator will be, you enable my advertisements, my commercials, I will sell it to my clients, and I'll give you a piece. The operator is going to say, wait a second. My boxes, my technology. I spent all the money to 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 uh, create this operation. You give me five minutes per hour as opposed to right. two minutes per hour. I'll sell it to my customers and give you a cut. So it's probably very likely going to come back down to the carriage agreements that happen every three years, and they will come. They will come to terms. They will. Okay. So this is uh, sort of the the tail on the dog. In other words, part of a much broader set of negotiations and issues that I operators so. and networks. I think uh, so, but it's okay because I'll be honest with you, Will, if everything was the way we all say we want it right now, two thirds of every advertiser wouldn't know what the hell to do with it, right? This is great right now when everyone's learning and exploring and figure out, figuring out how to use this. I can honestly say every time we execute a campaign, we learn more. Every time an advertiser executes a campaign, they learn more about what their true segment is, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to determine who you think your segment is. It's another thing then to see how that segment converts and then adjust the segment on the next campaign and balance the conversion. Mm -hmm. Right, that's real optimization. Not real-time optimization, but real optimization. Right, understood. And um, we talked before the session there, um, you've got actually a couple of campaigns that you're willing to sort of share some more detail around uh, that I think would be very uh, interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, what I said before were the three that we've really been able to share. We, we do a lot in the automotive space. We, we, we do. And we've been able, it was in the Wall Street Journal not that long ago, it was Volvo, and we were able to tie back addressable impressions to sales. And although the agency, we were not privy to exactly how much profit that was, the smile on the CMO's face when we shared with her these results were out of this world and they increased their budget significantly. So that's, that's a really good case study. Um, 
TV networks, tune-in clients, were able to determine which households have watched the previous season of their show or like shows, messaged us to them, and then determine which of those households tune into the program. We're seeing huge conversions rate, 15, 20, 30, 40% higher than just a national campaign. That's huge. Advertisers with first party data, although it's a huge pain in the ass to match first party data against subscriber files, right, all that legal nonsense, if you do it right, it works. I mean, we've seen clients where we've targeted both their subscribers with a certain message or their non-customers with a, with a, you know, with, with a different message. And, and we've seen an increase in customer base by, by, by 20, 30%. So we're seeing real results. But, but again, as I said before, if we do our job right and we get the segment right, we do the math right, we articulate the, 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 the appropriate form of measurement, the stuff always works. Yeah, Mike, a couple more questions and then we need to break. Um, so obviously there's a lot going on in the TV network world right now in terms of data initiatives, yeah. investment in data. Can you just talk a little about what you think of those data initiatives, how they play relative to addressability and sort of how this is all going to unfold when everyone's doing their own thing? Sure. So the majority of the major TV networks, broadcast and cable, they're all coming out with, you know, seeing as how they don't have household addressability, none of them do, they're coming out with what they can do, which is what, you know, we refer to as high indexing. They do a similar type of ma data match against a similar segment, and we can determine how each network, how each program, and how each day part indexes, performs, delivers, whatever term you want to use, against that segment. And they're all doing a very, very good job of bringing that to market. But there's two, and advertisers are excited. And it's going to be a huge factor going into this year's upfront. But there's two problems with that. One is the same as we face with all the systems today. They're all doing it differently. right? That doesn't make it easy for an agency or an advertiser. The other problem, and the biggest problem, is there's still the debate on who gets the value. So TV network A will look me in the eye and say, my data is suggesting that my longer tail content is delivering well against your high value segment. Therefore, you should pay buy more of it or pay more for it. And I agree with them 100%. But when that data suggests that their prime time stuff delivers 20% low, lower, do I pay 20% less? Or do they throw their arms in there and go, oh, supply and demand? That's kind of the crock of nonsense that we're facing right now. All the value can't go to one side. In order for this stuff to work, and this applies to any type of national data-driven application, both the buyer and the seller need to agree on one thing. We all agree that an average price for adults 18 to 49 is $40. Some of that might be worth 60. Some of it might be worth 150. Some of it might be worth 20. Some of it might be worth nothing. And as long as both sides agree to that, then I think we can enter the marketplace and make this work. If we don't agree, if each side wants all the value for themselves, then it's not going to work. I'm not going to ask you what you think the odds of everyone agreeing actually are, because I think I know what the answer to that would be. But let me ask you one final question, yeah. just kind of wrapping all of this together a little bit. Um, there's been a lot talked about, especially Turner has been very public about the idea of reducing ad loads, mm -hmm. right? Improving the user experience, if we all kind of put our own viewer, consumer hat on here for a second, sure. you know, we'd all probably say, yeah, fewer ads is a better experience. I agree. We've seen the success of Netflix and you know, the other SPOD players, et cetera. Does everything that you're doing in terms of trying to zero in more on the specific target uh, audience and you know, focus on eCPM, et cetera, bring us to closer to a day when ad loads can be reduced, or do you not see that happening down the road? Honestly, and I don't mean to, to dodge the question, but I see it both ways. If we get the message right, and we're sending relevant messages, I think people will watch them, the advertiser will get the value, and the commercial load can remain the same. However, in a non-addressable world, which will be the case for like a Turner for a long time, their good research is telling them that reducing the ad load is going to deliver higher engagement. The question is, is that higher engagement going to justify the premium CPM? Now, we learned when this happened with Full Episode Player, right, when Mike Shaw announced in 2005 that you can watch Grey's Anatomy on a computer, the ad load was far less, the CPMs were much higher, with 18, within 18 months, they had leveled off. So I don't think that going to a mu that we can reduce the ad load too much, um, but I could be wrong on that. Time right. will tell. All right, we'll see. Mike, thanks so much. Mike Bologna. Thank you.